for another online science lesson. Why am I wearing such a woolly jumper in the middle of May? It's for special science reasons, which you will find out about. Um, you can count on me to inspire you, uh, get your imaginations going with my science puzzles using household objects. And today is no different. Um, I would like you to tell me which one of these pan lids is my favourite pan lid and which one drives me crazy. So there's one that is made of solid metal, there's one that is made of glass and has a rubber handle. Which one of these pan lids is my fave? Which one do I really not like? The other puzzle which will be revealed, I've got two marshmallows here, or one on a metal skewer, one on a wooden skewer. Which marshmallow should I toast? The one on the wooden skewer or the one on the metal skewer? Uh, this is what we're talking about today. We are talking about materials which conduct electricity and heat, which allow electricity and heat to flow through them, um, and materials which don't allow that to happen. So, if you've got a wooden spoon and a metal spoon at home, give them both a feel, you might find that you think the metal one is colder than the wooden one. You think that? If you touch anything metal, and anything wood or plastic, the metal one feels colder, right? But they're both in the same room, which is the same temperature. Why is that? Adults, can you explain that to the small people now? No, maybe not. Never thought about it before, but all will be revealed. What we're going to do now is we're going to put an ice cube. I'm going to get two ice cubes at the same size to make it a fair test. I'm going to put one ice cube on the ow, wooden spoon ooh, and one ice cube on the metal spoon. Which one is going to melt first? Will they both melt at the same time? Which one do you predict will melt first? Metal spoon or wooden spoon? Let's set that exciting little experiment to one side and come back to it later. Okay, so in order to explain all this stuff about materials that allow heat and energy to electricity to flow through them and materials that don't, I need to make a confession, okay? Uh, in our air lesson, quite a long time ago, I told you that particles were like little balls. Remember that? I said that you could think about air particles as being like little balls that were floating in the air and that everything in the world is made of particles. Well, that is true, but it's a, particles are a little bit more complicated than these little balls. And if we're going to learn anything in today's lesson, the first thing I have to tell you is why they're a bit more complicated. Um, I'm going to do this by showing you some magnets first of all, because you've probably all had a little play with magnets, so you probably are quite familiar with the fact that if you put two sides of a magnet together, then they push apart from each other. But if you put the other sides of the magnet, then they attract. So if you put the same sides of a magnet together, they push away. And if you put opposite sides, then they attract. Bearing that in mind, a particle, everything in the world is made of particles, and they are a bit like balls, but if I'm going to tell you a bit more detail, um, they're actually like little positive balls with little negative balls spinning around them, okay? So the simplest particles that stuff is made of look like this, a positive ball with a little negative ball spinning around it. And all the positive and negative tells you, really, is that they are attracted to each other. So it's just like magnets, two negative things push away from each other, two positive things push away from each other, but a negative thing and a positive thing are attracted to each other. These little negative balls that are part of the particle, they are called electrons. And basically, the entire lesson today is about electrons. These little negative balls that are attracted to positive things, but push away from other negative things. So if you're thinking, this, I'm not sure about this, you'll probably understand about electrons by the end of the lesson. Because the whole lesson is about electrons, but if I'd called it an electrons lesson, who would have come to that? In plastic, the atoms are all joined together in strings which look a little bit like spaghetti. Okay, so plastics, all the atoms strung together, all mixed up uh, in long strings, look like spaghetti. Metals are super special. In metals, the positive balls in the particles are all staying still. And the little electrons, the negative balls, are allowed to whiz around freely. And the fact that these electrons can whiz around freely means that they can carry energy 
through metals. So metals, because electrons can whiz around freely, can have uh, heat travelling through them and they can have electricity travelling through them. But we're going to look at heat first. So I've boiled a kettle and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you down here with me and we'll have a look at these uh, cups. Couldn't find a metal cup, so I've got a jug. But made of three different things. I've got a plastic cup, I've got a glass cup, and I've got a metal cup. So I'm going to put boiling water into each one. This is really, really, really hot water. It's like 98 degrees. Uh, probably don't try this at home. Um, which one would you recommend that I touch? And which one would you recommend that I do not touch? If I was going to drink some water, I won't because it's too hot. But if this was delicious coffee or hot chocolate or something, which one of these should I touch? So the, that's my little picture. Yeah. Maybe you're saying the plastic. Should I do it? I'll go for it. Yeah, fine. Yeah. In fact, probably quite dangerous because it doesn't feel hot at all. If I drank it, I would really burn my tongue. Um, and that's because the particles in that plastic are all twizzled up like uh, spaghetti. And it's really hard for heat energy to travel from the water through the plastic. So my fingers aren't feeling any heat at all really because all the heat's staying in the cup. Glass. Yeah, that's pretty warm. That's quite nice and warm. Um, but it's not painful. Glass, actually quite a good insulator. So plastic we call an insulator because it doesn't allow heat or electricity to travel through it. Um, glass, also quite a good insulator, but generally the glass that we use in like windows and cups is very thin. So I can feel quite a lot of heat there. Um, metal is not a good insulator. It's a very good conductor. That means it allows electricity to travel through it. Yeah, that's hot. I'm not, don't try this at home. I'm not going to touch that. This one's got a handle, luckily. Don't let me forget that by my feet is a load of boiling water. Uh, this might not end well. Oh, plastic. Very good insulator because its particles are all tangled up. Metal has positive particles with lots of negative particles that are called electrons whizzing around it which allow electricity and heat to travel through it. Um, oh yeah, this is the good bit, okay? Stay with me down here and we're going to do our first little experiment which explains why my hair is in this slightly weird hairstyle and why I've got a woolly jumper on because I want you to get your plastic bag and we're just going to have a little look at static electricity. I know, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, lockdown haircuts 2020. We're going to have a look at static electricity. Now, you, you probably know, maybe you've come across it, that if you rub a balloon on something woolly, then you can stick it on the wall. Get a plastic bag, plastic, don't forget, an insulator, doesn't allow electrons to travel through it. Just give it a good rub on your hair. It work better if your hair's not too long, but you can already see that. Oh, look at that. See, that's what you're looking for. Let's do that a bit more. Give it a good rub on your hair or on someone else's hair. What has happened there? You've probably seen this before, haven't you? We call this static electricity, but what has actually happened? Well, plastic is an insulator and your hair is also an insulator. So what you've done is, amazingly, electrons are really tiny, you can't see them, but you have actually rubbed electrons off the plastic bag and onto your hair. I think that's the way around it is. So this plastic bag's got less electrons on it than normal and your hair has got more electrons on it than it had before. Imagine that, you've actually done that now. Teeny tiny little particles, so small you can't see, tiny little electrons have gone from that plastic bag onto your hair which makes the plastic bag a little bit more positive and your hair a little bit more negative. Now don't forget, negative things push away from each other. So if you imagine that each one of your hair strands is now negative, that's why the hairs don't want to touch each other, each other anymore. This is why I look so great now, because the hairs are pushing away from each other, which is why they do that cool, standy, uppy thing. Keep your plastic bag. Um, oh no, you know what I've done. I've put my hair clip down like fast while I was talking and I don't know where it is. I'm going to have to keep this awesome hairstyle the whole time. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Uh, keep your plastic bag. We will come back to that. You will need your hair again. Um, but we're getting very close to story time, actually. 
first of all, what I want to show you is that that is basically how lightning works, what I've just done there. So we're talking about electrons, teeny little negative particles, rubbing off things during a storm. What we think happens, scientists still aren't totally sure, but what we think happens is that hot air rises during a storm and hailstones fall and they they sort of rub against each other and electrons rub off the air particles and end up gathering at the bottom of a cloud. So you've got a storm cloud with more electrons on the bottom than there are at the top. Now don't forget, electrons, they are all got the same charge, they're negative, they push against each other so they don't like all being together like this and eventually when there's so many electrons building up at the bottom of the cloud, one of them gets free and this causes an avalanche of electrons. So all the electrons break free from the cloud and go down to earth. And, uh, and that's what lightning is. It's just a flow of electrons travelling from a cloud down to the ground. And in fact, that is all electricity is. is just a flow of electrons. And again, something which you've probably noticed, but maybe you didn't think too much about. If you look at a battery, you'll see that one side of the battery uh, is, it's got a little plus sign on it for positive. And one sign, oh good, you can see if I pull it back a bit. And one has got a little negative sign on for negative. And that's why uh, electricity flows when you put a battery into something. Because the electrons that are near this side of the battery want to push away from that negative side. And the electrons that are near the positive side of the battery, uh, they're attracted to the positive side. So electrons start doing this. And if you put a battery into a wire, you've created an electric circuit. Um, Right, story time. We're going to look at the person who discovered that electricity could flow through things. Because nowadays, we know that electricity flows through metals. That's how electricity gets from the power station to your microwave or your washing machine or your TV, uh, is through metal wires. But a few hundred years ago, people didn't really think that metal had anything to do with electricity because they knew about static electricity, um, but rubbing metal on your hair doesn't really do anything because the electrons can just flow away. Um, they were more interested in static electricity. They knew a few hundred years ago that charge could jump uh, from one thing to another and that created cool sparks. So let's have a little look at what was happening in the world of static electricity a few hundred years ago. Uh, our first little bit of story time begins with someone with a magnificent name. This is Professor Peter van Muchenbroek, and he was the first person to show everyone that charge could be separated. And he designed a thing that looked not really at all like this, called a Leyden jar, but it was a glass jar that had some metal in it, and it could store charge. And uh, Professor Peter van Muchenbroek discovered that if he touched the jar with one hand, and he touched a metal... Uh, rod with the other hand, he got an absolutely dreadful electric shock. Um, and when he, when he wrote a report later, as scientists do, telling everyone what they'd done, he, he very clearly said that he had discovered a new but terrible experiment, which I advise you on no account to repeat yourself. But of course, everybody did, didn't they? Because everyone in those days, the 1700s, they loved electricity. And no one loved it more uh, than this chap. Stephen Gray. You might not have heard of him. Why haven't you heard of Stephen Gray? We'll get to that. He was born to a father who dyed cloth for a living. But Stephen Gray, well, he wasn't very satisfied with this life. He didn't want to make cloth a nice colour for a living. Um, he couldn't afford to go to university, so he did something quite clever. He made friends with lots of rich people who had libraries, which granted him access to lots and lots and lots of fantastic books. Um, and these people were very generous with their books, and Stephen Gray was a very hard worker, and in the end, Stephen Gray read a lot of books and got quite a reputation, actually, as a very, very good scientist. He started working with a very famous person called John Flamsteed, who helped him out, and between them, they discovered marvellous things. Uh, Stephen Gray discovered that electricity could travel through metal wires which no one had looked at before. Uh, and he became most famous for a really fantastic, um, very dramatic experiment that he used to do called the flying boy experiment. He used to get an orphan boy uh, and charge him up with electricity. You can't do that these days. It's political correctness gone mad. But he used to hang a boy 
from a swing which had uh, silk threads. Now silk doesn't conduct electricity. And what he would do is he'd get a special machine and he'd charge up the boy with electricity. <laughs> Uh, this is true, just like you charged up your hair earlier with static electricity, he would charge up the boy with electricity and then he would swing the boy and the boy would do amazing tricks like when the boy's hand went near a book, the pages of the book would turn on their own. Uh, and when the boy went near some gold leaves, uh, the bits of gold leaf would stick to the boy. Now, the public at the time was super excited about electricity. It was, a, it was like going to the cinema for them. Everyone wanted to go and see electrical tricks. And Stephen Gray's trick was, became one of the most famous tricks out there. He was a very good showman. He knew exactly how to work the crowd. Um, he used to get members of the crowd to join in. So people would come and stand on a plastic box and touch the boy and nothing would happen because plastic is an insulator. Electrons on the boy didn't have anywhere to flow to, so they weren't interested. And then they'd get people to come over and just stand on the ground, and then the electrons would very happily jump off the boy and into the member of the audience and flow into the ground. Um, and the audience would see fantastic sparks in these darkened rooms in the 1700s. So why have you never heard of the name Stephen Gray? It might be that he didn't have very much money, so he couldn't afford to be a member of all the cool societies at the time that he had to be a member of. It might be that he was friends with John Flamsteed, who was the arch enemy of Isaac Newton. And the rumour is that Isaac Newton didn't let him publish any books because he really didn't like who Stephen Gray was hanging out with. Uh, maybe that's not true, but Isaac Newton also was the arch enemy of one of my favourite scientists, Robert Hooke. And have you heard of Robert Hooke? No, but you haven't, have you? There you go. Isaac Newton, uh, famously brilliant scientist, but perhaps not a very nice person. Right, have you still got your plastic bag? We're going to do something even cooler with the plastic bag now. I want you to get a load of little bits of your plastic bag and pull them off and sprinkle them onto the floor. Uh, plastic bags obviously got to be reused, so try and get a bit of plastic bag which doesn't compromise the structure of the plastic bag. Take a little bit off the handle or something. Just put a few tiny little bits of plastic bag onto the desk in front of you. What we're going to do is you're going to rub your hair again and then you go fishing little bits of plastic bag. If you've got any children that are usually too young to join in with these lessons at home, my one year old really enjoyed um, having her hair rubbed with a plastic bag and then being picked up and just used as like a fishing rod to catch little bits of plastic. Rub the plastic bag against your hair like we did before. go. Done it. Yep, looking good. And then try this. Dunk your head into the little bits of plastic bag and see what happens. You ready? Ah, oh, look at that all in one go. That's your afternoon sorted, isn't it? <laughs> you can thank me later. How many tiny little bits of plastic bag can you pick up with your super static hair? Yeah. There. I'm not expecting you to listen to anything I say from now on. Yeah, but no, let's actually think about this please, Emily. Let's think about this. So before, we rubbed electrons went from the plastic bag onto my hair, so my hair was uh, negative and the bag was more positive, so they got attracted. But this time, I didn't rub these bits of plastic bag with anything, did I? They haven't got a charge, they're not negative or positive, so why, when you rub something with a plastic bag, can you touch it against something which doesn't have a charge and it's still all get stuck. What's that about? Well, that leads us nicely to our last experiment that we're going to do with water because a lot of particles are a bit like water. Water particles are pretty special. Do you remember me telling you in our animals lesson about surface tension? I said that water was quite special because it bonded quite strongly with the water particles next to it. Well, that's because water particles are a little bit negative, more negative on one side and a little bit more positive on the other side. Um, so this is like my explanation of what happens when water tension um, allows animals to like walk on it. It's because the particles join up so the positive and negatives are together. Um, but all water particles are like that. Get your plastic bag, rub it on your hair or just rub it on something woolly. And this is where I said that you needed your kitchen tap because what you're going to do is put your kitchen tap on that's running a teeny tiny teeny amount 
I obviously haven't got a kitchen tub here so I've got a yoghurt pot with a tiny little hole in it and I'm going to pour some water in so I get a tiny little trickle I'm going to charge up my plastic bag knock some electrons off it and then put it near the little trickle and see what happens I'll fill my tub with water now as usual if you haven't got the stuff you just watch me rub in my bag got my nice woolly jumper there we go. put it in front of my face right ready oh, you see that it's a really good one to do at home because all you need is a plastic bag and the effect is really dramatic you see that moving So what's happening there? Well, your plastic bag has got a positive charge and it's attracting the little negative side of the particles on the water particles. You can stay really quite far away and you should find that a little trickle of water is attracted to a plastic bag. I know, Christina, it is amazing. Um, there you go. So the last example of a thing in real life that I want to tell you about is these electricity pylons. So have you ever thought about this? Electricity is travelling through these metal wires, because metal is a very good conductor. Um, but the whole electricity pylon thing is made of metal as well. So why, don't, why doesn't the electricity travel through these wires, through this big piece of metal pylon and into the ground? It's because these bits here, these long dingly dangly things, are made of uh, ceramic, which is not a very good conductor, so it protects you. There you go. And that is the end of our static electricity heat lesson, except we need to solve my puzzles, don't we? There we go, I think, I think I'm just going to embrace this hair for what it is. Oh, look at this! Did you find the same thing with your ice cubes? So I was saying maybe it wasn't a fair test, because an ice cube is a slightly different size. You could. You can see that the ice cube on the spoon has almost completely melted on the metal spoon and the ice cube on the wooden spoon is still in pretty good shape actually. Um, that's because, as we know, metal contains lots of free zipping around electrons and metal is a very good conductor of heat. The temperature of your room is warmer than the ice cube so all the electrons on this side of the spoon, which are in the warm air, are vibrating and vibrating, knocking in, just like air particles, knocking into each other and travelling through the spoon and heating up the spoon and then those vibrations are travelling into the ice cubes, sort of giving the heat energy to the ice cube. So the ice cube on this spoon was getting warmer, this wooden spoon was quite insulated, so energy, heat energy from the air wasn't getting through as easily. Um, why does a metal spoon feel colder than a wooden spoon? This is good because they've both had an ice cube on, so now this one feels really cold, and this one feels warm. Well, it's because this one, now, your hand is a lot warmer than the air outside. So the metal spoon is conducting heat away from your hand. You're, effectively, the electrons in the metal spoon are stealing heat from your hand and carrying it away. Whereas because the wooden spoon is an insulator, uh, they're not. Back to my incredibly exciting puzzles. Which one of these marshmallows would you rather toast? One on a wooden skewer or one on a metal skewer? If you were going to stick a piece of wood and a piece of metal into a fire, you'd probably find that electrons transferred heat all the way down your metal stick quite quickly and you would burn your hand. Whereas the wooden one, good insulator so the heat doesn't... Which one of these is my least favourite pan handle? Oh, do you know? This one looks so good in the shop, such a beautiful colour, it's so heavy, oh it's quality, but it's a metal, it's a metal handle on a big metal, can you imagine if that's just been sitting on the hob with a lovely sausage casserole in it for an hour, when I grab that handle, which I do every time, it burns my hand every time, it really hurts. Where's this one? Look at this. It's got glass, which as we know is a bit of an insulator anyway, and it's got uh, rubber. Now all the particles in rubber are just shaped like, they're all joined together like spaghetti, aren't they? So no heat is travelling through that pan handle into my hand. So today's dramatic conclusion, this is my favourite pan handle. On that bombshell.
lesson ends. I will see you all next week. This is brilliant, there's loads of people here. I can't get away with an edge you lot. Hello Liam. <laughs> Hello Cameron. Yeah, I'll come to school, of course I will. Hello Natalie. Hello Alexa. Ah, uh, Elliot's gaming with his brother. Pfft, yeah, of course. God, Elliot. Grace asked, is wood better than plastic as an insulator? Thank you, Grace. What a brilliant question. Um, wood is a good insulator because it's got lots of air trapped inside it and air is a good insulator. Uh, it's a good question, is it better than plastic or not? Mm, not sure actually. Why does some hair get more staticky than others? That is a good question. I deliberately didn't put any conditioner on today because if you've got any product on it, it makes it less staticky. Can you get electrified in water? Yes, Jill, yes you can, yes. The fact that you're asking me that worries me. Yeah, you can, don't put any electricity near water. Uh, water is a very good conductor, that's why. That's why humans are good conductors because we're basically just bags of water. Oh, why birds don't get electrocuted on the wires? Yeah, that's a good question. Ah, oh, Jago, you love them. That is the, this is the only thing you engage with willingly, is it? That's good. It's pretty much the only thing I engage with willingly as well. That's not a joke. You are frozen. I'm not. I've got this big woolly jumper on. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah, it's not funny. I can't do anything about that. I think that's your end. Maybe refresh. Birds on cables aren't earthed. You make a very good point, Anna Sharp. Yeah, very good point. Do birds get electrocuted when they take one foot off a wire? If a bird... No, see, Anna's right, you'd have to be... You'd have to be grounded, like the electrons need somewhere to flow to in order to move. Um, so birds aren't touching the ground, so the electrons wouldn't have any reason to go into them. I get, but I guess if you... I don't know. If you... If a bird was ever unfortunate enough to be, like, on a hill. Exactly, thank you Rachel, that's exactly the answer that I was trying to get to. If it had one really long leg that could touch the ground, then yeah. It's great when you just support each other, so I don't need to be here. <laughs> Bye everybody, see you next week.